my name is Dennis Daly, and I'm the department head of archives and special collections here in the NMSU library. That's where you are now, so welcome. Uh, on behalf of the staff of the archives and special collections, we want to welcome you to this event today. Uh, the great presentation on uh, the incomparable Fabian Garcia, who I'm sure many of you know uh, that name, and uh, with our, our friend Dr. Peter Cup. So thanks for being here. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, archives and special collections here at NMSU, uh, we collect uh, and preserve and make available to the public and to researchers uh, materials that document the history and cultural heritage of southern New Mexico, uh, the U.S.-Mexico border region, uh, as well as this institution, New Mexico State University. Uh, we hold the permanent records of New Mexico State University going all the way back to the very beginnings in 1887, 1888. Uh, and those include things like the records of the colleges and the departments and offices on campus, public <coughs> university publications, as well as the personal and professional papers of uh, various administrators and faculty members of the university, including people like uh, Hiram Hadley, the first president of the university, uh, astronomer Clyde Tombaugh, who <coughs> many of you probably know as the dis discoverer of the planet Pluto, uh, playwright Mark Medoff, and of course, uh, Fabian Garcia, the subject of our presentation today. Uh, we did bring out some of Fabian Garcia's original papers. They're on the table up here, so I hope you have a chance to take a look at those um, after the presentation. So aside from these university records, uh, we have a unit called the Rio Grande Historical Collection that uh, collects, again, manuscripts and family papers from the region. Uh, and the Rio Grande Historical Collections this year is actually celebrating its 50th anniversary. So for 50 years, we've been collecting archives here in the border region. Uh, you'll see on the walls around you, we have a display up talking about of the Rio Grande Historical Collections. This event is uh, the first event in hopefully many that we're gonna be doing this year to celebrate that anniversary. The next event will be here in this room on Monday, April 18th at 6 p.m. And that's gonna be a, a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the RGHC. So we would invite you to come back for that. And there were papers there on your uh, chairs with more information about that. So we hope you can make it, make that as well. Oh, we also have uh, some commemorative uh, limited, uh, limited run coffee mugs and pint glasses with our 50th anniversary logo. So if you're interested in those, let us know. We have those for sale. Okay, that's, that's the sales portion of the, of the program today. <laughs> Uh, I imagine that many of you know that the NMSU library has a new dean, and uh, he is here with us today uh, somewhere. I'd like to recognize uh, Kevin uh, Comerford. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So thank you. Thank you for uh, helping welcome uh, Kevin to the community and to NMSU. Uh, if you have a chance, you can greet him after again after the uh, presentation today and welcome him and give him your recommendation for the best place to get green chili <laughs> in the Mesilla Valley. Also, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize one person who's not here with us today, and that's uh, Jeannie Gleason. Many of you probably know Jeannie Gleason as well. She's pro professor emeritus and longtime media guru in the ACES College. And she really helped us uh, organize this event today and get the word out about the event. And you also have some little uh, chili seed packets on your chairs, and you can thank uh, Jeannie for those as well. So you can go home and raise your own NMSU variety green chili. Okay, uh, I want to introduce someone we have with us today. This person is the successor of the great Fabian Garcia. Um, don't let that intimidate you. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to have uh, Leslie Edgar, who is the current director of the Ag Experiment Station, come up and just say a, a couple of brief words. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome on behalf of Dean uh, Rolando Flores, who serves as 
uh, the Dean of our College of Agricultural and Consumer Sciences. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, so uh, in his stead, uh, he asked me to come and, and deliver greetings and, and a welcome on behalf of the college. As mentioned, I do serve as the director of our Ag Experiment Station, and so I, uh, I have a tremendous respect for Dr. Garcia. I've been here serving as the director for just about two years. And I remember as I researched his life and legacy as I interviewed for the position, I thought, what big shoes to fill? And they are. So as the first woman director of the Ag Experiment Station, I often um, lean on his legacy, his, his commitment and compassion for people, for, for his, you know, his, his, his research in inspiring the next generation to be involved with research. And so I hope that I embrace that in my role. And I know I see some of our researchers and our extension agents here, which is, is part of the land grant mission. And so we take the research and we disseminate it to the public. And it's a beautiful part of that tripartite mission. And so I look forward today to learning more about Dr. Garcia and his legacy. And again, uh, welcome on behalf of the college and we're grateful that you're here with us. Thank you, Leslie, and thanks for being here. All right, now to the main event. He, I see him crouched down over there. We didn't save him a chair, unfortunately. Uh, Peter Cup is an agricultural historian in the history department of the University of Colorado, Denver. And he's the author of the award-winning book, Hoptopia, A World of Agriculture and Beer in Oregon's Willamette Valley. Uh, which was published in 2016, so we need to make sure you get one of those pint glasses. <laughs> uh, he was a member of the NMSU faculty from 2012 until 2019. He's been working on this project on the life uh, and work of Fabian Garcia for the past few years, and we're happy to have him down here, so please help me welcome uh, Dr. Peter Cup. Hi. How's it going? This is so exciting for me because it's the first time I've done an in-person event in a long time. And I think we're all excited about that. So let's not get sick. <laughs> um, it's been fun to be here. My kids are on, uh, my kids are eight and five and were born in Las Cruces. And uh, when I was teaching here, and, we, and it's their spring break this week, so we came down to um, go to White Sands and eat green chili and, and see the old house and everything like that. Uh, but I've also been working with a uh, dentist uh, to, to do a few more things in the archives and, and bounce some ideas off him. And yesterday, he and I went from a walk from, from the archive here to where I had determined Fabian Garcia planted the first chili peppers commercially in New Mexico. Uh, and we have some photographs, and we're gonna we're going to try to inspire Jerry's class. Jerry Jerry's a professor here uh, he, who teaches historic preservation, and the goal of this class is to nominate a historic site. And what's more historic than where Fabian Garcia planted his first chili peppers here on campus? <clears throat> My talk today is um, is a little bit different because I've uh, several, a few other scholars have talked about Chile and Garcia before, but the book I'm writing, um, which is called tentatively, uh, Chile Pepper King, Fabian Garcia and the Botanical Transformation of the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands, looks at a lot more than just chili peppers. I will talk about Chile today, don't worry, uh, but I'm gonna talk about his larger contributions. Uh, so we all know across the state we claim to be, I, I'm still a we, even though I live in Colorado now. <clears throat> we, we claim to be the chili capital of the world, Hatch, Hatch Chili, right? And they've trademarked the idea and everything like that. And uh, we, those of us in the Mesilla Valley here and at NMSU, we know that Fabian Garcia was the father of New Mexico chili pepper. What do we know beyond that? Uh, I spent a lot of time with extension workers out in the field and, oh, you're working on Fabio Garcia, the father of the New Mexico chili pepper. Yeah, what can you tell me about him? 
He was the father of the New Mexico chili <laughs> pepper. <laughs> so the goal of my book is quite, um, um, it, it's, it's a lot bigger and it's a lot more aggressive. And my argument, or my, I have five points I want to make today. They're simple. Number one, Fabian Garcia should be remembered for far more than just chili peppers. He and his protégés transformed the agricultural and botanical makeup from West Texas to Baja, California. And what I mean by that is he introduced new crops, his protégés introduced new crops, they were running the science centers on both sides of the border, his legacy is, is, um, is evident across this border region. Okay, so number one, Fabian Garcia needs to be remembered more than just Chile. He transformed the agricultural and botanical makeup of the borderlands. Number two, he had intense local knowledge of this place, specifically southern New Mexico and northern Chihuahua. But he also had an intense national and global knowledge connection. So intensely local and intensely global. I'm going to explain all this as in the talk as it unfolds today. Number three, he achieved success in his 50-year career despite being a dark-skinned Mexican in a world where dark-skinned Mexicans were not accepted. So, he, and he overcame racism with grace and dignity. Number four, I have to check my phone. Number four and five here. Paul, Paul is laughing at me. Number four, his legacy is abundantly clear in the landscapes of the borderlands that we encounter. When we go outside, when we walk down Main Street, Las Cruces, the plants we see are a result of Fabian Garcia. The plants in people's yards that provide shade are a result of Fabian Garcia. So it's not just chili pepper. We encounter the world Garcia created every day. And number five, my book wants to elevate Fabian Garcia as part of the broader story of North American history. Not just, he's, not just a, he's not just a resident of the Mesilla Valley. He's not just a resident of uh, New Mexico or the borderlands. His story needs to be told in textbooks across North America, period. So this is his story. <clears throat> Can everybody see the images okay? The beginning of my book, the introduction starts with this image, and the, and the introduction is called Beneath the Shade Trees. And those of you in extension, I, want, I'm, I'm, I think those are arbor, vid, arbor vitae, is that the right word? Is that, what the, is that what you think these are? Yeah? I don't think they're juniper, but I want to get it right in the book, so please, if, 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 if you know these trees, if you recognize these trees, let me know. <laughs> <clears throat> this photograph helps explain a few of the points I made earlier out of that list of five because there were several photos taken this day in the early 1900s of Fabian Garcia in front of these shade trees and the question and he's reading a book looking scholarly and, and handsome he was quite handsome um, why would he have a photo shoot in front of these shade trees The answer is because the rest of the desert looked like this. <laughs> and so he spent years upon years testing, bringing in new shrubs and trees to try to test what would live in the, in, the, in the Chihuahuan desert environment, okay? So my whole thing is that if you take a few steps back, you realize the desert looks like this. So this explains the transformation that he was, he was working on. He, he, just in this image, it explains how he was providing a source of shade for desert dwellers who had little respite from the sun for months at a time in the, in the summertime, right? So this is actually a very simple series of pictures these days. It tells a big story about these botanical transformations of the borderlands. You with me? Okay. Fabian Garcia was uh, born in Chihuahua, the city of Chihuahua, um, in the state of Chihuahua, 
He was, uh, he was orphaned. Uh, he was born in 1872. Um, I don't believe he knew that. His gravestone says 1871. Uh, but someone, in, uh, someone with the State Historic Preservation Office actually found his baptismal record, and he was, in fact, born on 1872, uh, on April 20th, which is the feast day of Pope Fabian, centuries prior. So I believe his name came from Pope Fabian. Um, he was also, it was um, Jesus Fabian, and I think the orphan children were all named he Jesus because they were children of God. In, in any case, he... Uh, he was adopted quickly by the Garcia family, a working class family. Um, but those parents died, and he, as many, uh, yeah, bad luck, right? He, he, his, 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 maybe point number six is he came a lot of, he overcame a lot of uh, adversity in, in, his, in his family. But his grandmother, uh, Hokoba, uh, took him in, as many of you know. And she moved north because the economy wasn't so good in uh, northern Mexico at the time, kind of in the frontier. And uh, she worked as a domestic in the Gila uh, mining district and eventually finds work in the household, as many of you know, of the Casad family of Mesilla, who were the largest orchardists of this period in the 1880s. Or this would be, uh, yeah, late 1870s into the 1880s. And so he lucked out in a lot of ways. He was because the Cassads, particularly Sarah Cassad, essentially adopted Garcia, and so as much as he got an education in school, he also got an education in agricultural uh, practices. Um, um, many people remarked during his lifetime that Garcia wasn't very smart or he was a slow learner. Well, he was born an orphan, he moved around in mining districts, he never got a proper education, he did not learned to speak and read English until he was about 15 or 16 years old. And then he goes to NMSU or New Mexico A&M a couple years later, where his classmates were saying, well, he's slow to learn. Where my response would be, you might have some challenges too if you didn't speak English until you were 15 or 16 years old. Um, that said, he becomes, um, Sarah Kassad uh, is very instrumental in making sure that he has tutors and extra educational opportunities. And in, uh, in 1890, he becomes part of the first graduating class of, uh, uh, or, um, he joins the first graduating class of New Mexico A&M. And this is a photograph that many of us have already seen from 1890, and here Fabian stands. And you can already tell uh, there's a story, many of us know the story, that there is, uh, Mesilla was the Mexican town, Las Cruces was the white, the Anglo town. And so pictures like this are very familiar. He's the only person of color in this graduating class. He would be only one of two Mexicans that attended uh, New Mexico A&M in the first decade. And he would be the only professor of color or Mexican professor for for a few decades into his work, until the 1920s. He lived in a white world, in an Anglo world. Um, and I asked a close friend, uh, why didn't he write about this experience, or why doesn't it show up in the, in the, in the papers, in the archives? And, and my, uh, my friend who's Mexican said, um, of course he never talked about it. Of course he never talked about it. He didn't want to disturb the balance or um, he, he had to figure out a way to achieve success despite the racial factors that existed at the time. Uh, so this is a big part of my book too. In any case, he was well loved by the, by the, by the college community. Um, as Chris Schertz has noted, I don't think he made it today, he's irrigating. Uh, <laughs> uh, he played on the first football team in 1893 or 1894. He was in the literary society. Uh, he, he did all kinds of extracurricular activities. And um, just to give you a sense of how uh, a Mexican person with dark skin inhabited um, a, a white college world, whereas um, Whereas the literary society, the Columbian society, right, Columbus, we already, we already can see the connection there. Whereas Columbus, uh, the, the literary society would say, um, have events such as, let's, let's debate why Columbus was so great. Garcia's turn, the next month would be, let's study the people of Puerto Rico. 
right? Or let's study uh, Cuban literature this month. You see what I'm saying? And so he found a way to, um, to exist and challenge uh, his peers despite coming from a very different situation. He wrote his thesis on trichomes. Does anybody know what trichomes are? I love it because there's ag people here, and they're like, yes, they are plant hairs, plant hairs. And I show this, I show this um, and it, it's all handwritten. This is remarkable. His thesis is in the, his undergraduate thesis is in the collection. It's uh, observations upon trichomes, particularly relating to those found on plants of the Mesilla Valley. So he became an expert on the plant hairs of the Mesilla Valley, right? That's pretty cool. Uh, but, but he wrote this thing out, it's, it's beautiful, the, the writing is beautiful, the, the, the English is proper and tight, his illustrations are beautiful. Um, when I show this to my eight-year-old son, he always says, Dad, this is a good example of why I'm a better writer than you. And I go, what are you talking about, James? He goes, penmanship, Dad. <laughs> so Garcia had nice penmanship, too. Um, when he graduated, he immediately got to work. He became an assistant horticulturalist at the university. He graduated in May. He started his job in June. He was a hard worker through and through throughout his life. Um, and um, I know some of you in Jerry's class, the historic preservation class, have maybe took, taken a look at the seed house which still exists on campus. This is the oldest building on campus. It, it was the only building that existed on campus prior to um, when the, the Morrill Act uh, allowed uh, for the purchase of, of lands for, for an agricultural uh, and mechanic arts college. Uh, so the seat house is still there today. And this was his main office. This is, of course, where they germinated seeds, where he would hybridize seeds, as we're going to talk about in a second. And, um, Sadly, when Dennis and I walked down the other, the other day, we found out it's a uh, <clears throat> repository for toxic chemicals and gases, so, um, which, are, which are important too, but um, I tried to get inside and I decided I didn't want to try, right, Dennis? <laughs> so if you saw me creeping around the building the other day. Uh, <laughs> um, Okay, so what does a horticulturalist do? A horticulturalist grows all kinds of crops and tries to uh, create, uh, find markets for them. This is my favorite image, and I'm going to come back to it a couple times. In 1894, um, Garcia started planting new crops. And the idea of the horticulturalist and the assistant horticulturalist was that he was going to, to import plants from all across North America, and in fact, all across the world, Seeds, uh, seeds, and then and grafts as well for, for fruit crops, for example, um, and and he planted them to see what plants would survive, to see how insects would uh, affect them in the desert community, and so on and so forth. And so um, here's the here's the seed house, which I call the station building, and this is College Avenue. And so you can drive if you leave today, you can pass this this the station building, and on the other side of College, this if, for those of you in the back. There's a bunch of uh, like shrubs and clovers and that type of stuff down there. These are orchards, vineyards, orchards, corn. And then there's more specialty crops, which is kind of how I've made my, uh, the first decade or so of my career is asking why do certain crops grow in special places, certain places. And so he has oats, wheats, rye, potatoes, cotton, tobacco, hops. Yeah, but thank you. <laughs> rye, potatoes tobacco, asparagus, so all these different things. But then you right, right here is peppers. Right here is peppers. So this is where Fabian first planted peppers in the field for horticultural and commercial purposes. Okay? He might have grown them at home, for example. But this is where the experiments at NMSU begin. And it's just adjacent from um, the station building. Um, I'm going to come back to that. I want to show you. Uh, in a historic preservation report that John Hunter and Marshall Weisiger worked on, they pasted this onto an aerial photo. So you can see that the, uh, the peppers are right here next to the seed house. Okay? And so here's the seed house as it looks today, as of yesterday. 
And so you would just walk this way, which would be northeast. And are you ready for it? This is super exciting. Here's where the first peppers were planted. <laughs> as Jamie Bronstein said, as I texted her when I was there yesterday, pave pepper dice, put up a parking lot. <laughs> So I, um, maybe Jerry and I and his class will work on trying to figure out kind of a spot where, where the first peppers grew. And I, Paul, did you, did you ever figure out that spot? No. No? Learned today. All right, good, good. Paul Boslin, everybody knows Paul, right? Okay. The former director of the Chili Pepper Institute, the, 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 the reigning king of chili pepper. <laughs> okay, so what else does a horticulturalist do? A horticulturalist breeds new plants, and this all goes back to uh, an Augustinian monk named Gregor Mendel, who in the second half of the 19th century uh, bred pea plants to try to achieve a better pea. And he figured out the idea of genetics, Mendelian genetics, we say, whereas that each seed has um, its own genetic makeup, and when you pollinate a seed, the pollen has its own. And so when you cross plants, you can get any kind of result. And so what horticulturalists do, um, and they still do today in the Chili Pepper Institute, as far as I can tell, right, Paul? Um, um, they cross breed seeds, seeds to see what happens. And then they plant them in the greenhouse, and they watch them for years, and they test them against um, diseases and insects and all this type of thing. And they try to find the best, the best child, the best, uh, the best cross, we call it, um, to, to plant in the fields commercially. So whereas he had this first uh, horticultural field into the 1890s, Fabian Garcia started, uh, and then particularly by the 1900s, he started making crosses. And at this moment in time, horticulturalists were famous. Um, some of you, some of you, I know, um, I don't think my generation or younger really got it, but, but, but certainly many of you have heard of Luther Burbank, who, uh, who discovered the Luther Burbank potato uh, and then made a lot of money at that. And then he became the wizard, wizard of Santa Rosa because he crossbred all types of new plants in California for commercial purposes. Um, some of you will be familiar with Liberty Hyde Bailey who um, was from the Midwest, Michigan, ended up in, uh, at Cornell, and he became the popular face of what they call the country life movement in the first two decades of the 20th century, whereas um, agriculturalists and agriculturalist reformers were looking to counter the increasing industrialism of the United States. Then, and there was value in going back to the land. There was value in agriculture and raising uh, uh, farms. Um, and then many of you will be familiar with George Washington Carver, too. He's most famous for, for peanuts uh, and, of, and the variety of uses of peanuts in the South. Um, uh, but he, too, uh, he, he was the first uh, African American to get a degree, to be allowed to go to school. I can't remember if he went to Iowa or Iowa. It must have been Iowa State. Iowa State. Iowa State. Iowa State. I love this crowd. I love it. <laughs> like, I never want this to end. This is. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so many of you are familiar with these people. These were celebrities, right? These were celebrities of the time because they were introducing new crops and, and berries and fruits and, and trees and, and all kinds of good stuff. Okay, but t take a look at this. Luther Burbank, California. George Washington Carver, the American South. Liberty Hyde Bailey, New York and, and, the, and the upper Midwest. There's no spokesperson for the borderlands in American history. So when I get to my point that Fabian Garcia needs to be included in American textbooks, I would like to see his photo taught along with these others. And I think you would too. In 1900, Fabian Garcia has the opportunity, he, he had missed zero days of work. And the, the, and the college says, go take a sabbatical, go take six months or a year if you want it. And, he, it, and the early records indicate he was going to go to Iowa State or Wisconsin. Uh, but he ends up going to Cornell. 
and he studies with Liberty Hyde Bailey. This is an, a key moment, a key six months in his life, because he makes connections with the leading minds of agricultural science, and he would keep these relationships for the rest of his life. Okay, and this is because all of his classmates would go and populate extension centers and experiment stations over the course of their careers. The, that was his cohort. Those were his friends. So even though he only spent six months at Cornell, he acquired that knowledge from Liberty Hyde Bailey and other professors, but he also made lasting lifelong connections. And in fact, uh, in the early 1900s, the only time Garcia ever tried to apply for another job, well, he, he, was, he, he applied for the um, research director at uh, Puerto Rico's new station as it was being built. Um, and there are letters in his file from Liberty Hyde Bailey, which is pretty cool, I think. Uh, I just like stumbled upon it one day. I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, so that was very cool. But in any case, this was also a very white world, right? And these photographs tell a million stories, right? Garcia's, hi Garcia's almost hidden here in the black and white photograph with all the other white students. Uh, and so once again, the story of overcoming racial discrimination to become, to become part of the cohort to overcome racism with grace and persistence uh, and to acquire new knowledge and connections. This six months at Cornell is, uh, is uh, it's at least worth a chapter in my book that I haven't written yet, but I will. <laughs> Garcia returns home to, as the head horticulturalist he gets his master's degree, essentially, they kind of said, you've taken enough courses and done enough work, here's a master's degree by, I think, 1905, and he starts teaching. Uh, so he's working, at the, um, uh, he's working at the experiment station, and he's also teaching classes. And it's here that he really begins to hybridize um, plants. It's here where he begins the Mendelian experiments. And in fact, uh, Paul just handed me over this, um, this really cool bowl, oh, I have to stay by the microphone. Um, this really cool bulletin, European Grapes, uh, from uh, 1906. And I've, I've looked through all of his publications, and they all touch on Mendelian genetics. They all touch on disease and pest resistance. And so, um, whereas um, kind of one of my side experiments I want to look at is like the language of experiment station publications. Because he's a beautiful writer. And to transfer that knowledge to the masses is really important. And that's what he's up to, and that's what we're still up to today. Thank you, Paul. Um, so here, Dennis, Dennis and I think this is maybe where he was uh, growing uh, chili outside of the seed house here, but he was hybridizing grapes, onions, pecans, all kinds of everything you can think of, grasses, sh shade trees. So the key, once again, you bring in as many specimens as you can, and then you cross-pollinate them, essentially, uh, or you graft them to try to create um, and extend uh, new commercial varieties. It was in 19, uh, it was in the first decade of the 20th century that he also begins his chili experiments. Um, the goal here, I guess I haven't said this clearly enough, but the goal with the hybridizing was to was to bring wealth to the Mesilla Valley and New Mexico by improving crops so that farmers can make more money, okay? And so when, when it came to chili or grapes or any other crop, the idea of hybridizing was to create better crops suited for the environment that are um, marketable, that are commercial, okay? So the story of, I'm using the story of Chile now as a stand-in, but he published dozens upon dozens, and, and, and he worked with dozens upon dozens of, of plants um, during his career from uh, 1894 to 19, about 1944. So here is the publication on Chile culture. I believe it's 1906. Is it on there? Oh, 1908. Okay, so, but I think he began the experiments a, a year or two before. Um, and in, in, this, um, um, in this publication, he says, the common Mexican chili that had been growing in this section for a number of years is exceedingly variable and of poor grade. The lack of selection and improvement of this chili is clearly seen in the numerous different shapes, colors, and sizes of the pods, 
On the whole, the old strain of Mexican chili is not large or good enough for the cannery, which is important. I believe there was one cannery in the Mesilla Valley at the time, maybe a couple in Albuquerque and more in um, Los Angeles, Southern California. Uh, he continues, taking into consideration the adaptability of the chili plant in this section, its usefulness as a vegetable, the marked lack of uniformity of the crop, and the need of better varieties, the work of improving the Mexican chili was begun during the summer of 1907. And this is a cool connection that Paul Bosman, Boslin's already made in articles uh, about chili peppers. But Garcia, point number two that I made was that he had intense local knowledge and intense global knowledge. He was, in, he was drawing upon the Mendelian stuff and the Liberty High Bailey stuff, but, he, but, but fundamentally, because he was Mexican and because he spoke Spanish, he was, a, he, he, he was able to connect with farmers on both sides of the border. And so when Paul writes about the varieties of chili pepper that Garcia acquired, they come from both sides of the border. He's acquiring varieties just from people planting them in the fields. Those of you familiar with the term land race uh, varieties, well, they're just, he's just pulling pepper varieties and then, and then uh, pollinating the seeds and, and see what to see what happens, essentially. Uh, and Paul, remind us of the, uh, the three varieties that, he, that he, he used here. Chile Negro, Chile Colorado, and Mesilla. And they came from here. But originally from Mexico. But originally from Mexico. And wasn't there one that came from, didn't he use some from um, Sonora, too? Not necessarily in this. Oh, I don't know that answer. Okay, fair enough. But he was, in his papers, he's acquiring uh, materials, plant materials from, uh, from both sides of the border. And he was able to because of his connection with the landscape and the connection with the people of the borderlands. So Dennis actually has... <clears throat> The original drawings by Garcia. Uh, he he. Uh, this is in the photograph collection in the archive, and th the sad part of this that many of us has discovered is that the chili pepper he eventually releases for public use in the 1920s is number nine, which is the one that we're missing, <laughs> which is sad. Should we just fill it in? Is that bad? Is that bad, Dennis? Um, so he, he's confident in this variety by about 1915 or 1916, and it's, uh, and it's out for public release by 1920. And, and I had hoped to finish my book by uh, 2020 to, to coincide with that release, but, you know, Pandemics happen, and <laughs> pandemics happen. Okay, so we already covered where he planted his first peppers, and then a lot of the hybridizing and um, and the greenhouse and the growing of the early uh, um, hybrids occurred in, in seed house as well. Well, at the same time, I mentioned his family relations. He married an Amador, Julieta uh, Amador. She was very sick her whole life and in fact the archive has records it's in one of the most it's one of one of the most beautiful um, parts of his story is that he started courting Julieta in about um, 1906 they get married in 198 but they exchange these love letters because she's often in hospitals due to tuberculosis and Bill Eman actually introduced me to these letters um, you were going to do a project about um, TB hospitals or something like that Disease experiences. Yeah. Um, and so these letters are just very passionate and, um, and very interesting. And she calls, she calls Fabian mi negrito, which means my darky, essentially. But it was meant as a term of endearment at the time. Um, in any case, they get married, but she continues to have health problems. They move into, they go to Niagara Falls. I often think, think it's funny because a lot of people use this image of Garcia and they kind of cut out Julieta because it's a nice photo of him. I always feel bad for Julieta. Um, um, but in any case, they have a, um, the, the story is very sad. And I guess I'll just say they have a child together, but uh, the child dies at about three months old. 
uh, Julieta, Julieta's in and out the hospital, particularly in El Paso. Uh, they have a home together right downtown at the edge of, um, at the southern edge of Main Street. Um, uh, but she, she passes away in 1920. So his family life is just one of tremendous loss and, and sadness. But in a lot of ways, I think many of us have determined that he, he from that point forward, he, he really just marries himself to his career. Um, so Garcia becomes the head of the um, he consults with extension and becomes head of the experiment station. He travels around and he, and he thrives upon the mission, which is to provide knowledge to the people. Uh, and, and as he's doing that, he also acquires new knowledge of landscape and agricultural practices from the people. So it's reciprocal. He, took, he takes the train around the state. He takes horses around the state. He eventually buys a car. Uh, I, can't, I couldn't determine his first car. I, I want your help with it because he, there are photos with him in a car, and I have the deeds for a couple of his, or I don't have them, but they're in the collection. Um, he works with Elephant Butte, which is a huge transition because now we're dealing with irrigated agriculture uh, along the Rio, Rio Grande uh, corridor, and he consults with that, and that ultimately allows for other crops like cotton and onions and pecans that he also is going to hybridize throughout the 1910s and the 1920s and release for public planting and commercial use, okay? So, and when he finds that success, he spreads it to, as I said, his mentees and his protégés on both sides of the border. I've documented them from West Texas on both sides of the border all the way to, to Baja, California in terms of the people that studied under him. And they would exchange new varieties, right? So grano onions become a super important crop in, in West Texas, for example. And pecans, of course, in the Amencia Valley. Uh, but then there's all these other crops we don't think about, like the shade trees, right? People are planting shade trees in their communities, in their schools, in their businesses, outside their homes. And so when I say that he transformed the botanical makeup of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, I'm not kidding. It looks differently fundamentally because of Fabian Garcia. And the breadth of his success is overwhelming. Um, Dennis asked me to go uh, t t till, about, till about right now, so I'm not going to go to the details of these other crops, but essentially it plays out the same way as Chile. I used Chile here as a, to represent the process that he engaged in over and over and over again. He achieved su such success that the, uh, the Mexican government brings him down to De Efe and then around to the agricultural regions in southern Mexico for advice on how to um, commercialized agriculture in Mexico during the uh, Porfir uh, after the Porfiriado. Um, uh, so he's also uh, playing a role in Mexican and commercialization uh, and, and, uh, of Mexican agriculture. All along, he loved his students and took care of his students. He had a particular affection for Mexican students. Um, he would allow them to, he would provide jobs for them first and foremost, but he'd allow them to stay at the seed house uh, and other places on campus if, if they needed a place to live. Um, so even though he didn't have a family, the agricultural community of southern New Mexico became his family, I would say. Um, Anyway, all, all this wonder, wonderful, I'm fast forwarding, to, to the 1930s. Uh, he, he maintains his office on campus. He actually got a new office in a different part of the university when he came back to the seed house by the 1930s, because that, that was his home. Um, and, uh, and he finishes out his career into the 1930s and into the 1940s before he gets sick and the, and the college uh, removes him from his position. His dying wish is to leave his inheritance to the university, which he does. He creates a scholarship for Hispanic students. Um, and in terms of his legacy around here, it's not just the plants, but it's the physical environment in terms of uh, uh, Fabian Garcia Hall and Far Fabian Garcia Annex, which we see every day on campus. The Fabian Garcia, uh, um, well, it's what is the, the Fabian Garcia Science Center that's just um, down the street 
uh, from, the, from the Seed House and from us here at, uh, in, the, in the Science Library. Um, so I guess, I guess my challenge for you is to, is to think about all the ways that we encounter the, the legacy of Garcia on a day-to-day -day basis. And for me, coming back for a week after being gone from New Mexico for three years and going through a pandemic, it's been, and, and spending, and, and, most, and going through all the archival materials, because they've been digitized. I've gone through every single th possible thing I could think of that's available. And to come back here after I've done, finished that research, uh, and walk the grounds, and, and looked at the shade trees, and, and walk with Dennis to figure out where the first chili pepper was planted, it's been very powerful and meaning for me. And, uh, and I think it's given me the, uh, uh, the, the excitement I need to, to ignore everything else and get this book done, right? <laughs> um, Fabian Garcia dies in 1948. Um, he is buried in the Masonic Graveyard um, Cemetery. Um, my last, before I leave town, I'm going to go visit him one last time. Uh, he was born in 1872. I don't know how we correct that. Um, but in turn, but this, maybe this is not a historic preservation project. Uh, but all the wealthy on this, let's see, the graveyard will face us this way. Um, and over here you have the, the Hadleys and the wealthy white families. And then his grave is just kind of stuffed in a cluster with other graves. And it is upsetting. He deserves, and he deserved better than that. So I'm going to spend the next several years of my career getting this book out, but also working with people like Jerry and Dennis and, and Paul and the rest of you to make sure not only that New Mexicans know that there's a lot more of the chili pepper to Fabian Garcia. Uh, he indeed transformed agriculture and societies and economies across the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, and he deserves to be part of the broader story of North American history. Thank you. Questions. Feel free to field questions if you'd like. Yeah. I love questions. Or if you have answers, that's good too. <laughs> yes. Is, is there uh, research going on in Mexico now devoted to the, to the chili pepper, similar to what is, what is happening here today? It's a good question, but, but my story stops in 1948, so I'll turn that over to... <laughs> Paul, mm -hmm. do they have a, something similar to the Chili Pepper Institute in Mexico? They don't have a Chili Pepper Institute, but there is a lot of research, and believe it or not, most of the bell peppers you eat come from Mexico, so they've really got a great big uh, pepper industry. Thank you. Uh, in the back of the green mask. Yeah. Okay. That's just what we got. Um, so I, I'm very interested in the shade trees. Um, are you going to tell us a little more, or is that the teaser so that we have to read? You get it. <laughs> I need to do a little more research on them, too, before I make any big claims. I was hoping you'd have some answers for us. Jerry? Yeah, so I, I find the, the title and the research very fascinating that you're calling it this, transfer, this, this transformation across this like large geographical space. But I wonder, as um, since I give my classes tour of campus, I wonder how did how did Garcia alone transform the campus? Is there any way that, like, there's this Trost walking tour of campus? How could we have maybe a Vivian Garcia walking tour of campus by looking just at plants? So I, I wonder if you can maybe share in your research, like, if there's anything still around. Um, you know, the rumors are these con trees on the horseshoe are Garcias. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows, but that's the rumor. They, so. they date. They date correctly. Okay. So I was wondering if you could share if there's anything else like that that we should pay attention to when we walk around. I think this is one of those wonderful moments for interdisciplinary work because it's going to, but it's going to require historians and ag scientists to figure this stuff out. I'm not pretending to be uh, an agricultural scientist, so. Um, I do know the difference between a chili and a pecan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but, um, but um, I know the experiment station and, and extension are interested in collaboration, so I think this is something <coughs> we could and should do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, please. Yep, you. Yep. Um, this, you maybe already just answered that you wouldn't know this, but um, I know that Luther Burbank was responsible for introducing some pretty uh, nasty and racist species. Did Garcia introduce any? Um, <laughs> That's a really good question. And, and the idea is that if you're importing all kinds of different plants to crossbreed, you might be introducing new diseases and pests too. That's a great question that I don't have a good answer for. You guys are stumping me. Um, I have kind of a partial answer, but let me think about it for another second. Yes, please, Larry. Um, sort of totally off tangent, but Mendel was a monk and had no problem with the genetics. Nonetheless, the 19th century war between um, religion and science was pretty uh, dramatic. Um, and uh, Cornell was, was certainly one of the um, hot plots for that. Um, and um, Garcia ends up being buried in the Masonic seminary, uh, Cemetery. Well, in the Catholic part. In the Catholic, he was a pious Catholic. I, I wondered what his religious affiliation, if any, was. So he was Catholic. Yeah. He was a Catholic, and he didn't bring up any of the eugenics or none of this that stuff in his writing. He was just focused on the on the work on this on the work at hand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. I think that that you know they say some people might roll over in their graves at some of the stuff that's happening today with with chili research and the development of new of new uh, chilies. Uh, but I think he sits up in his grave and takes notice because if you drive through Hatch, Garfield, and Array, and see the fascinating things that they're doing with the chili crops, it, it, it blows you away. You know, they're, they're de I, I hear they're, they're developing new chilies so that they can use machines to harvest them, but yet uh, recently, in the last few years, they've started underground irrigation. Underground irrigation where they put the tubes into the ground and they're watering from the bottom up. And uh, it's increasing the crop yield and uh, Fascinating to watch them put in the tubing, take out the old tubing. Um, the chili workers, I, uh, I filmed, uh, well on my phone, uh, last year I filmed them picking the chili. Oh my goodness, you know what a labor intensive job that is. You know, even though a lot of the, 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 the different uh, types are, are done with machines, it's still, it's still labor intensive for human beings to do that kind of work. But the, the development of new, of new species uh, uh, is, is just fascinating, just fascinating. I, I also wonder about, about what happened in northern New Mexico, you know. They're so fixated on, chi on Chimayo chili, which is, to me, a fantasy. You know, it's a small <laughs> chili that, that they don't grow enough there to feed a family. You know, <laughs> yet, yet, yet they're selling it at the farmer's market for $30 a pound. And we all know that it comes from Hatch, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, I, and, I, and I do know that, that, uh, that uh, Dr. Boslin, I, I believe they collected seeds many years ago from all different farmers from around the state. You know, that, that was fascinating. And I, I do know that they've analyzed a lot of those old heritage seeds and some of them aren't as pure as they thought they were. Mm -hmm. You know, so his, his work goes on. Fascinating work that continues and continues. I, I, like I said, he sits up in his grave in, one, in, in awe at what's going on. I, I, would, I would agree with you. I think because Garcia, what, he embraced modernity. He, he was very practical about the applications of his research and work. And so if he could see the, the Chile industry success with continued modernization, and new technologies and, and science, I think he would be pleased, you know? And how cool would he would be like, yeah, hatched chili capital of the world, and that's me. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, which side are you gonna fight on when Colorado's making claims that they're uh, the chili capital? <laughs> yeah. I, when, I, when they ask me up there, I, I'm often asked to speak on that. The Pueblo, Colorado chili industry only began in the, in the earlier mid 90s mm -hmm. um, but when people ask me there I'm very diplomatic and I'm on cameras and so I'll say the answer which I always get which is I love green chili <laughs> 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 so I, yes sir
Yeah. This is really trivial, but I won't get another chance. In the, <laughs> in the Las Cruces Railroad Museum is a photograph. Do you know about that photograph? There's several prominent citizens, including Fabian Garcia, at the station. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good photograph. I was just talking with um, Joanne Beers. Is that? Yeah, she'd be mad at me if I didn't advertise <laughs> the Railroad Museum. There you go. She knew I was here. Visit the Railroad Museum. Fabian's there too. <laughs> yes, sir. The question is, do I have a publisher and when is it going to be released? Um, <laughs> 2020. <laughs> 2020, that's right. Uh, I'm working, uh, my first book came out the, in a, with the University of California Press and their, and their Food and Agriculture series, which is really top notch, so I'll probably do that again. But this particular book I'm writing, I'm, I'm not writing it as an academic work, I'm writing it as an accessible work. I want this book to be, you know, in every New Mexican's home so that they can understand and embrace the story. Um, and so I'm, 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 there's not a lot of jargon in it. It's short, sweet, to the point, moves quickly. Um, I just need to finish the second, uh, the second half. <laughs> Thank no you. Pressure. No pressure. <laughs> now you can just, you guys just email me every day. <laughs> hey Pete, are you done yet? I'm already done. <laughs> Yes? Uh, I, I'd be interested to see if there were any um, like archival uh, uh, recipes and how, how the food culture kind of changed. You mentioned the, the, the uh, material nature changed, but I, I learned about the culinary nature changes as well. Yeah, absolutely. By the late 20s and the, and the 1930s, there's a, oh my god, I'm drawing a blank on her name. Fabiola Cabeza de Vaca. Fabiola Cabeza de Vaca, she, she gets a degree here and then she starts working in extension and she starts publishing chili recipes and, and it helps sell the idea of New Mexican cuisine. So that's a result of the success of the chili pepper and then that's a su the success of extension by that time period too. She has an amazing story too. She and Fabian were quite close in the 1930s before he died. Also salsa is the number one condiment now. So, uh, that's right. That's right. It, it is a, and it's a, glo it's a, it's a national and local, but it's also a global story because of the, you know, the success of salsa and green chili. Yeah, Larry. Um, in, to answer that question, uh, NMSU has a, a large collection of community cookbooks, um, which are very important in um, tracing out food matters and food ways, and they come from everything like the the Sacaton cowbells with <coughs> ranchers' wives, um, to restaurants and uh, various social organizations. We also have um, Dave DeWitt's uh, chili pepper collection, a good deal of which is actually international, um, but also has a lot of, of course, uh, material on chili peppers. Thanks for that question, because that's a super important connection I didn't make. I feel like in some ways I've just scratched the surface and I want to tell you a lot more, but how about I come back with my book next time and we'll chat again. Yeah. Sound good? Thank you guys.